How are you doing? All good? <laughs> okay. It's pretty hot here. I don't know if you have to be honest. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about GraphQL. And I'm quite excited because um, this is a topic that I've been following for the last half a year. And now it's in a pretty sweet spot. So how many of you have been uh, um, learning about GraphQL before this session? Okay, a lot of people, very good. So mainly, the first reaction when you talk about GraphQL, let me just, just prepare you for the mandatory slide. <laughs> yes, we need a cat. <laughs> it's kind of a scary, so this is the face that I'm expecting from you, it's like, what are you talking about, Jenna? What is this? Okay, before we go into the topic, I'm going to talk about myself. So, I'm a Google Developer Expert, and probably you don't know what it means. It's just a cool title that you get after doing a lot of talks, and uh, meetups, blogging, and things like that. And then you get invited to events like Google, and some other thing, which is pretty cool. And you can see me like doing some silly stuff with this uh, Super Mario uh, cap. I also do some, some other things, uh, like being a master of ceremonies. And this was a conference in Switzerland. And I'm not going to do anything like that today, but I was playing with the audience with some beach balls and some other things. It was pretty fun. Um, this is my blog, so if you are interested in this topic, I have a few, few blog posts on GraphQL. You can follow, um, you can follow with uh, much more detail in there. I'm also a trainer and a community leader. So I run two communities in London. I'm basically, sorry, I'm basically an Angular guy. And this is, <laughs> this is my Angular zone. Uh, community in London, and just recently I started the GraphQL London Meetup, and it's been so successful that you can see that it has more members already than uh, the Angular Zone one. And the Angular Zone one maybe has a year and a half, but the GraphQL London is only four months old, so it's pretty pretty successful. And um, because of that, I learned React. <laughs> Because if I write a blog post using Angular, nobody cares. So, because I like GraphQL as a technology, and I want you know my research to be uh, listened somehow, I, I had to move to uh, React, which is pretty cool. So GraphQL, a lot of people don't uh, don't know GraphQL, but I've seen that you most of you know what it is. I'm going to go a little bit back, so. You can, um, you can follow through. So this is the logo, and you, some people when they hear about GraphQL, they think it may be a, a graphic library, or it may be a graph um, database, but actually this is pointing to the GraphQL schema. And we can see some, some of these nodes, uh, these will be types. And I'm going to go through this a little bit later. If you want to, uh, to follow GraphQL, I think a good start would be um, following the creators. And from, from these guys, I guess the most active uh, these days is Lee Byron. And he was also organizing uh, GraphQL Europe. Everything that happens in GraphQL is basically in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. So it's really good when some event happens in this side uh, of Europe. Any of you were at GraphQL Europe this year in Berlin? Okay, I guess it was just me. Very good. So let's go back a little bit into the timeline so we can get a, a better idea of uh, GraphQL uh, evolution over these past few years. So it all started in 2012 when uh, Facebook 
was, grow, was uh, going uh, through this migration from HTML5 uh, clients to native apps. And maybe you remember this in your phone. So this is the application, the Facebook application at the time. So basically, Facebook invented GraphQL just to ease that migration. And if you are using uh, Facebook since 2012, you are already using GraphQL. And one of the main issues that they wanted to solve, it was the complexity. And uh, the REST APIs couldn't, uh, couldn't help them, so they had to invent this uh, new stack. It's not only until uh, 2015 that they uh, decided to open source this technology. And the first thing that they did was create the first specification. And they decided to use um, JavaScript and publish the specification, um, the reference uh, implementation in JavaScript in this GraphQL JavaScript. And you can follow it. And from that moment, a lot of people wanted to implement that same technology for their stacks. So you will see not only uh, GraphQL on JavaScript, but also in other technologies like Python or PHP and some other languages, which is pretty exciting. A year passes, and it's in 2016 that we have some other highlights. And I want to stress some of them. And possibly the most important is uh, GitHub decided to migrate all, all of their public APIs to use GraphQL. And there's possibly another detail, that, which is uh, really cool. They still have the REST APIs working, but the way they implement them is using GraphQL behind the scenes. So actually they remove all of the REST uh, APIs code. And now it's all fully uh, driven by GraphQL. There was also some other things. So there's the new GraphQL website, which I'm going to show you later. And this is also important. There's the first uh, GraphQL uh, conference. And this is in October last year. And it was pretty successful. And they also show this, what is called GraphQL First, which is basing your development uh, using the schema, and then passing the schema to the backend and the frontend guys, so they can work together at the same time. For this year, we have a few um, <coughs> things going on. So the first thing is the final release of Apollo client, which makes uh, development much easier for you. Then there's GraphQL Europe, and some other things that uh, have been announced in the GraphQL community. So one of them is Launchpad, and this is a really cool um, online tool where you can build your own GraphQL server totally online. And you can even share a URL so some other people can use that GraphQL server and implement cool stuff. And there was this example with um, Shasko uh, was implementing uh, React Native application using this uh, launch path. So it was able to run this GraphQL server and then feed uh, React Native application. And just yesterday, they announced GraphQL Explorer, which is more or less like a website that you can um, refer to any of your colleagues or maybe um, your team leader. And they can see like an overview of, of the stack and all of the different options, tooling, uh, best practices. So let's see, let's see that new website that was announced um, just yesterday. So as you can see, it's a really modern um, website. We can, uh, we can just go in, into the tutorials, there's some guides, uh, there's also some nice um, successful use cases where you can use uh, if you want to uh, implement GraphQL in your business. And this is something that uh, was not available before. What we had before is the GraphQL um, original website, which is more like a technical reference. And maybe if you want to start implementing some of the features, maybe this is a good uh, starting point. 
And one of the cool features that you can use is you can run some of the queries right on the website, so you don't need to set up any environment, which is uh, pretty cool. Just uh, beginning of this year, there has been some tooling announced on GraphQL, and probably this, uh, this is pretty interesting if you want to use it in production. So you can, you can follow all of the queries that are being executed in your GraphQL server, and you can see a few things like how many requests, you can track the request, you can track uh, what's the response time, and uh, implement some interesting catching options. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And yeah, I was talking about this um, tooling before. So you can, you can run into this launchpad, uh, graphql.com, and you can see uh, how you, using Node, you can implement your GraphQL server, but just online. And maybe it's too small, but you also get the GraphQL endpoint. And this is a public endpoint that you can share with other people, which is pretty cool. And there's also some tooling that you can use, although I haven't introduced it yet. So as I was saying, once um, Facebook uh, published this uh, open source specification, there were other people interested in using GraphQL in their companies. And we can see a few of these implementations. I mean, we have .NET, Python, Java, PHP, but also some of the coolest um, stacks after that. So we have TypeScript and uh, Go Language, Scala, and Elixir. So as you can see, it will be difficult not to find something, some stack that you can use in your environments. Let's see a simple query language. So as you can see, we we only have uh, an endpoint, and this is uh, one of the differences uh, against REST APIs. We are using this GraphQL uh, endpoint. And I'm just passing this query, and we can see what will be the result. And one of the main uh, qualities of GraphQL is that we can, from our client, we can uh, predict what will be the structure of the response, which is uh, pretty much a JSON object following the structure of the query. So we get this user, which is a type, and we have some filter here, which is just grabbing the information for that user and getting the Twitter account. And that follows this one-to-one -one, uh, relationship, which will make the client's um, development much, much easier, easier. If you think about probably some of your past experience using REST, uh, sometimes you would like to change some of these parameters, you would like to configure what is the information, and sometimes the endpoint is not giving you that same information that you want which will result in some wasting of uh, the bandwidth, like overfetching. With GraphQL, we don't have that problem because we can specify what the fields that we want, and we don't have to do any uh, dynamic configuration on the server side. So let's see REST APIs and GraphQL side by side. When we have a REST client, we, we will be using separate endpoints, and these endpoints, this is just a, an example, but it uh, pretty much shows what would be um, the scenario that we will be dealing. So some of these endpoints, imagine you have to access for a user profile, maybe some images, maybe some uh, uh, other information that is uh, coming from different data sources. So you can, you can use SQL, or maybe you have some MongoDB to get that information, and then for the images, maybe you are using S3. This results in, in many queries happening on this layer, which is not the case for GraphQL. So let's see what happens uh, when we move this uh, to GraphQL. The first thing that we can see is we only have one endpoint, and that will make development much, much easier. We don't need to worry about creating these uh, different endpoints and how to deal with them. We can just write our queries and specify what we want as a result. Um, the technology that GraphQL brings into this um, picture is what it's called the resolvers. So when we write our queries uh, specifying these different types and implementing these resolvers, what we get is a nice layer which only deals with the different data source. 
So as you can see now, instead of having this uh, interdependent um, business objects, we have this uh, specialized business object which only deal with one data source. So one of the questions that um, people ask when uh, facing a new technology like GraphQL is, so who is using it? And probably the first that comes to mind is Facebook. And of course, Facebook is cool that Facebook is using this technology, but we don't work for companies like Facebook. So let's, uh, let's face it, we need some other people, maybe not as big as Facebook. So the first one is GitHub, which is really cool for us developers, but there are more and more uh, services using this technology. So now is not very much a question of if the technology is good, but how you can use whatever best practices these uh, companies have learned. Uh, some of them are Heroku, OpenTable, and Yelp. So these are pretty massive uh, big websites using that technology. But anyway, Facebook has proved um, the viability of it anyway. So in this talk, I'm going to uh, show you how I built an open source tool uh, for Q&A. And I built that tool for uh, GraphQL Europe. And this is the basic uh, architecture. So you can use on the client, you can use basically any of the, um, the frameworks. Um, there's React, there's Angular. And we are going to use Apollo Client to help us run these queries and interact with the GraphQL server. Then on the actual server, I used um, a tool which is called GraphQL, which is a GraphQL server as a service. And it's pretty, it's pretty much a console um, that I can use and create my, uh, my schema, and then I can just set it up really quick. So let me show you a demo. And I was thinking for the previous talk that we could have been using that tool. So this is, this is how it looks. You can use this in your mobile or your laptop. And maybe you have seen this other tool, which is called uh, Slido or Slido. And it's basically a tool where you can add these questions and then also vote. And this can be used for um, at the end of a talk or also for um, conference panels. And the way it works is I, I can just type a question over here. It will get um, on all the clients that I use in the application, it's using real time. And you can also vote the questions. You get some, oh, you can all, only vote once your own question. Let me just log out so you can see this, this animation. You get that also on, uh, on mobile. And yeah, so. This is the, the tool that we are going to work. If you want to, if you want to start using it, um, I also have some moderation uh, features, so I can block you. Don't be, don't be nasty. Okay, so that thing. Let me just show you my powers. Okay, okay. Don't force me too much. So this is more or less the the tool. If you have any questions, you can add them there. I'll be checking on the background. So let's start with the GraphQL schema. Um, the GraphQL schema is what um, gives us a lot of the features that we, um, that we are very proud from, uh, from GraphQL and give us a lot of um, advantages. So let's see, let's see how that can be built. So that's a type system. And that's in the center of uh, the GraphQL technology, building this, uh, this schema. So you have, you have different options. Obviously, you can, um, you can specify all of the common types like integer, float, string, so on and so forth. Um, we have a special type, which is the ID, which will depend on the, um, the server-side infrastructure and may change from implementations. And, but the most powerful features that we can implement our own types. And in this uh, application, I'm going to use a very simple type, which is the question type. And uh, we're going to see how that, um, that's going to uh, allow us to build these uh, different uh, uh, Q&A application features. Uh, the main entry points 
that we have from uh, the graphical schema are the query, which allows us to fetch information, the mutation, uh, which um, allows us to change the different types, and then we have this real-time feature, which are the subscriptions. I'm going to go into more detail later, so let's leave it like this for now. For the schema syntax, we basically have these two options. We can define mandatory fields and also nullable fields, which is uh, optional fields. So the main difference between these two is this um, exclamation mark. So that will uh, tell us that this is a mandatory field. And we will see more on the actual schema definition. For arrays, we can use the common square brackets that we, we are very familiar with JavaScript. So that will mean that we have an array of strings or an array of questions. To build this application, I use this uh, graph pool, and I'm going to show you how it looks. Uh, this is just an, an old version. So let's let's just go and see the tool. Well, you get this environment with different uh, sections, and the first one is the schema, which we were talking. As you can see, maybe, yeah, that's big enough. You can see that I have, this is the final implementation. I have uh, more fields. Let's maybe look into the question one. So I have defined this body, um, field here, and this is a mandatory. Let me just maybe make it a little bigger. And then I have all the fields. Um, probably the most interesting ones are the ones at the bottom, which are the relations. So this is also another important feature from uh, GraphQL. We can all, not only define these types with different fields, but also the relations with other types. And it's, it's that easy. So in this case, I'm, on the first, I'm defining a relationship with the user type. So that means that every question will have a, a user that has created. And then I also have this um, other feature for the voting. And you can see the usage of this, the list and also the mandatory flag. So let's see some other features. Once we have our um, schema, um, graph pool, this is more specific to graph pool, but you have this graph view, which was built for uh, one of the community members, so we can specify one of the types and we can see all of the relations um, being highlighted. So that's pretty cool. Some of the things that we get is this environment which we can use to write our queries. And there's more things to it, but um, that's, let's leave it there for now. So here we can specify our um, graphical schema and then use it to build our application, our clients. So let's, let's look at a simplified version of it. So on the, on the entry point, we have this query and mutation. So we, we use that as the, as the starting point. And then for this example, I'm going to show the all questions query. And in this case, I also get some uh, parameters that I can, uh, I can use. And this is uh, given to me by uh, the graph pool implementation. And that's going to return um, a list of questions. And the skip and take is uh, some parameters that I can use to just uh, limit the number of questions I get. For the actual question tag, I just uh, <coughs> going to show this ID and body, which is just uh, an ID to um, handle the different operations, and the body is just a string, the actual uh, question. So it's pretty easy to follow so far. Um, on the mutations, we have a similar, that the entry point just uh, to remember. And for the mutation type, you can see that we are using now uh, an argument, which will be the actual question. And for mutations, we can also specify um, the information that we want back. So we, we can not only create a new question, but also get some of the fields of that question object that was created. So for example, you could 
um, get the new ID that was created and then update your client with that information. So these are baby steps. We will have some, uh, some gifts from Bender. Um, the next thing we are going to look at is the graphical tool. So this is some tool that comes uh, by default. So every time that we build a graphical server, we will have this uh, tool to make um, to run our queries. And this is just um, to show some of the features that the graphical schema gives to us. And that will be also available into our IDs. So one of the things um, that impressed me more from GraphQL is that I could just implement the queries on my uh, AD and I could see all of the type check-ins and all of the information coming from the, from the schema without having to access any uh, third-party um, tool. So let's see a demo of that. If we go back to this, um, I'm going to use actually the GraphQL uh, environment but the graphical default environment is very similar to this one. Here on the, on the left side, I have the query, and, and then I'm using uh, some naming, so I'm uh, naming this query with questions, and I'm using this all questions entry that we had, and I'm going to show you right here. And this is giving me a few of the fields that I can use. And these are the filters, so I'm getting some of these from uh, GraphQL. And then the most important thing are the fields. So I'm using for this, for this query, I'm using a fragment. And this is a cool feature from, um, from the GraphQL specification, and is that I can uh, define these um, subsets of fields that I can use in different, uh, in different queries. So every time that I deal with a question, I don't have to uh, write these fields again and again. And I can use this spread operator to just get the fields here for me. So let's run this query. And we get, we get exactly these all questions and then all of the different fields. We get also the, the one that I flag. Okay, there's some questions there. Yo, okay, cool. Okay, a lot of uh, trolling. <laughs> so I'm going to show you some of these features. Let's let's just filter and use this um, first. I'm just going to take one, and then this is the one that I created myself. And I'm going to show a few, few, uh, few features like alias. So one of, the, one of the problems that we face when we are developing new clients is that maybe we want a different shape. And usually when we have REST APIs, we need to contact the backend team and make a request for a new endpoint to be created with these changes. So let's imagine I want to use a different ID. And because I use this who I did, I, I just want to contact the, end, end, uh, the backend guys and do this change. With GraphQL, I can just go and use this um, common syntax, and I will get, instead of um, the ID I was getting before, I get this new ID. And this is, this is just a small uh, example. If I can use this uh, for many of the different options, so for example here, I can do I can use a filter. <coughs> if I don't want to see the the ones that I've blocked, uh, I think it's false. Let's see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can apply different filters and let me just show you another feature which is I can query multiple um, questions. questions. Imagine I want to retry all of these uh, different questions and I also want the ones that I flagged. 
So I can simply run these two quests, uh, two queries together, and I get I get both with a simple with a simple uh, request. So this is uh, this is just to show a few of these features. Cool. There's um, there's a website that you can uh, that you can use to play with this um, with this graphical tool, and uh, this is GraphQL Hub, and you can see in this um, video um, it's showing some of these uh, queries, and you have uh, access to uh, Twitter, you also have access to GitHub, and uh, some of the nice uh, public APIs that you can start playing. So that's GraphQL um, Hub. Very good, nice. So let's cover some of the different pieces that you will have to build to create um, an application like the one I show you. The first thing is um, we will focus on the client, and in in my case, this will be the Apollo client. So let's see how how that uh, would look from the GraphQL server perspective. So in our client, we will have basically two interfaces. <coughs> one to fetch data, and the other one for uh, doing mutations. So the query, the query API will look something like this. We will have a database, and <coughs> we will use some, uh, some query using the GraphQL schema, and we will get that data on the client. If we want to change the data from that um, GraphQL schema, we will use mutations, and that will do the opposite. So we will get the query from, uh, from the client, and then that will change um, the database. So this is the overall uh, architecture. Let's see, let's see how we can build that. Um, by using the Apollo client, what we get is all of these uh, features to run queries and mutations, um, and also add some of the um, of the caching features, which is also nice. Um, Apollo Plane is using Redux under the hood, and we can also implement some reducers on our client using that um, Redux implementation. Another thing that we can use when we are using React is uh, these bindings that will um, create these uh, properties in our components, so we can run these queries uh, in an easy way from uh, a React application. Finally, this, uh, this uh, template literal syntax that will compile our queries and run them on the server without having to use complex API. So we can use these um, template uh, strings to define our queries, the same as I did with graphical, and then get um, some of the features from, from the tooling in my IDE. The setup is pretty easy. So we just create this Apollo client, and then we use um, our GraphQL endpoint. So we just need to use this uh, URI here. Then we can also specify how are we going to deal with the IDs. And this is to tell the Apollo client how to deal with uh, catching objects. If we don't specify this, it will just try to, to fetch the information every time from the server, which cannot be uh, what we want. Then we just pass this client uh, to the bootstrap. And if we look at the bootstrap, it's pretty much a simple um, React uh, bootstrap. The only thing is we have now this um, high order component, which is the Apollo provider. And then uh, I'm showing an example of how to mix uh, the Redux um, reducers with your own. So this filter is one of my own uh, reducers. And this, um, this is um, how we mix the Apollo uh, Redux with our own. Um, what we will use is the Compose, just to get uh, both reducers combined. And then the way we pass this information down to our application is by using this Apollo provider high order component. And we can see how we, uh, we set the client and also the store. The main APIs that we use is, um, of course, the query and mutate, but also if we want to um, interact with the reducer from a Apollo client, we can use these update queries. 
which will uh, be a review so that we can use, once we do an operation on the GraphQL server, we can affect our Redux uh, instance. I have some, um, some recipes here. So this is um, showing a query. And it's very much the query that I, I used before. We, we have this all questions query, uh, retrieving this ID and the body for the question. And then the way we interact uh, with a React application is by adding this to uh, the properties in our component. So I'm going to uh, add, depending on the different stages, while this data is loading or when there's an error, I will create these props that then I can use on my template. So it's pretty easy to interact. The way I'm going to use that is when I get the results, I'm just going to add this list prop, and then I can use that uh, on my component. Let me show you a mutate example, which is a little bit different. For this, I need to pass some data from the UI, which is now the question, and then I'm going to create the question, passing that information using this uh, dollar syntax. And I'm going to retrieve back this ID and the body. And this is a little bit more interesting. So what I'm going to use is this uh, mutate. And that's going to uh, use the update queries to run this small re uh, reducer. So I'm taking the result of that mutation. So we are adding a new question. And from that new question, I'm getting the new ID. And I'm also getting the text, <coughs> the body of the question. Um, I could also use this from the, um, the UI, but I'm getting both, and then I'm just changing um, the internal state uh, for the Redux, which is uh, using this all questions entry. Pretty standard uh, code. You can you can ask me later if you if you miss some of this. So let's look into a some more interesting uh, feature, which is the real time. And subscription, subscriptions were just added to the, to the specs um, early this year, and there's no much uh, information around them. So this um, Q&A application is quite interesting. You can also check the code online in my GitHub um, uh, profile. So let's see how that works. For subscriptions, we have a a more complex interaction, what we get is from the client, we can use this mutation API, and what will uh, happen is that we subscribe to changes um, triggered by mutations. So for example, in uh, the Q&A application, what I want to know is when I add a new question, I want to inform the different clients. So I'm going to register that, which will register um, these events, and these events will be then broadcast to the clients. So for example, if I create a uh, subscription for when I add new questions, every time that I run a mutation, it will create these events. Then the events must go to the different clients. So I must broadcast to any of the clients that are using the application, and then pass the information of the actual uh, mutation. So every time you add a question in your, in your mobile phone or your laptop, this is bro being broadcast to all of the different clients. So if we are maybe three, 400 people in this room, that will go for each new question, it's moving these 400 small messages with the question information. Um, let's maybe do a demo of that. I think that's that's a good demo. So I have I have this subscription code here on the left, and I'm going to um, subscribe to the question mutations, but only um, to the ones that are created. Maybe you can see it now. And once I subscribe to this uh, subscription, I'm going to um, request. Um, these question fields. And these are the same from the fragment. So this is the same information that I'm using in other bits um, of my app. So let me just subscribe. So now I'm listening to any questions being created. Um, maybe some of you can create a question now. So we will see it there. 
I can do it myself. Let's see if it comes up. Okay. Let me just do it myself. So I'm going to create a new question and I'm going to say something silly. Hey guys. Hey. Yes. Yes. And I'm going to run this notation that I have prepared. And you can see the result. That's the result that I specified in the notation. So what I said is, okay, create this new question and give me back the fields. But we need to go back to the other tab. And now you can see that I have this um, same information here. If you, any of you go and create more questions, this is still subscribed. So any new questions will be shown on that screen. And this is also the technology that I'm using on the client. So every time you create a new question, all of the clients receive that question. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, in order to build a real-time feature, we need a, some other set of dependencies. And this is basically to, um, to deal with this uh, uh, public subscription uh, channel. And you can use these GraphQL subscriptions to build that. And that's on the server side. And then on the client side, we are using WebSockets. So we need to use these subscription transport WebSockets. And the setup looks very similar to what we had before. Um, we need to specify this endpoint, which is using WebSockets. And I'm using a GraphQL um, endpoint. And then I just need to um, glue together these two uh, network interfaces. So I have the query and the mutation going into uh, HTTP. And uh, this uh, real-time feature, the subscriptions, going into this WebSocket uh, channel. Then I can use the client and just pass it as we did before. If we see how we specify this on the schema, this looks very much the same. So we have another entry, just specifying this new type. And then on the actual subscription, we have a filter, and this is just because we don't want to subscribe to all of the possible mutations, but um, just to some of them. You can also subscribe for uh, updates and deletes, but in this case I only wanted to uh, check for new, new questions. You can use any of the other options. And you, you just need to specify that in this uh, mutation in filter. And then as we saw, we can specify the fields that will go in the broadcast the messages that will go to the, to the different clients. The actual code for the subscribe, it looks very much like this. So we have the query, this will be the subscription that we saw. And then uh, we're using the update, uh, update query API, which is very much uh, the reducer implementation for that logic. The only thing that I, I faced when implementing this feature is that I had to check for duplicates. And if you think about it, what happens is I receive the message, but if I'm the creator of that question, I also receive the message. Because I subscribe also to these um, changes. And I subscribe not only to the questions created by other people, but I also receive the message from myself. So you just need to filter that. And then um, the rest of the code is just updating the Redux uh, store. So as a wrap-up, why you would use GraphQL? So I'm going to try to show a few of uh, the features. So this is, this is an unfortunate view. So this is to show you that it's not always clear if it's good for you. It may seem like it's a good solution, but you need to make sure it's the right solution for you. And this is just to show that. So vendors thought that would work, but well, it actually works, but not with really this way. <coughs> So some reasons. Um, it's good that it's a declarative uh, query language. We can specify the query that we, uh, that we want by using the schema. And um, this is telling what we want, but not how we want it, which is good. That's also a way to decouple from uh, the data source. And GraphQL is um, one of these um, um, usages. Usually it's like an integration layer. So if you deal with different data sources, uh, complex varying data sources, you can put GraphQL and easily 
kind of uh, create these mashups. Another good uh, feature from GraphQL is that because we use these schemas, um, we can validate the queries and we can also validate uh, what's the documentation around them. So if you remember, when I was using this GraphQL uh, tool, I had the information when I was typing the different queries. And maybe I'm going to show you a little bit more. And this looks more or less when I'm writing my queries, if I try to write um, the different fields, I get this information. And you get this in your ID, which is, which is really cool. So we get um, this other feature. It also is, this is the, um, the collaboration between teams, and this is also one of the reasons why Facebook uh, use it. And if you think about it, when you're using this schema, you can just uh, share this schema with other teams in your company, and everybody will just be using the same uh, information, which is uh, really, really cool. And we haven't covered this in, uh, in detail, but it's really, really super fast. What happens is because Facebook uh, was looking into implementing these uh, native apps, everything that GraphQL is using is just to reduce the, uh, the bandwidth and just to make, um, put all of the queries in one request, or as much as, as you can, squash all of this information so you don't uh, uh, overfetch. So everything, makes GraphQL really interesting to look at and to use. If you want to learn more about this Q&A application with some other features, um, like how I use um, this authentication and some other layers, you can, you can check this blog post and learn about it. And I think we are done, yay! Thank you. Maybe what we can use is the application for the questions. You, you want to try that? Yes, but um, oh, I want to say that we are a bit off schedule. Okay. So probably we can have like a couple of questions. Yeah. And then I would suggest everyone who have questions to ask George directly after the time so that we don't spoil them for between you and the food. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's see what it comes up. Yeah. Cool. So let's see them. So this is the view with the uh, bots. Is there is a way to use GraphQL to um, handle transactions? Well, the actual how you implement um, the actual. Um, business layer uh, or the server side layer is up to you. So if you are using transactions today in your PHP code or in your, your node code, you can still use it. Uh, the way you can build that with the GraphQL server, it will depend on how we're using that today. Uh, I don't have a specifics on uh, how to use uh, the different ways to use transactions because that depends on the data source. But if you are using, if you are experienced enough and you are using that on your REST API, you can translate that into GraphQL uh, easily. So let me just... Let's get the next question. Okay. So how should I do GraphQL server if I want to split all my backend code in microservices? Well, this is, this is a very good question and it was covered in another talk happening at the same time. <laughs> so maybe you can reach the speaker when we go into the break. But that's exactly what the other talk uh, was about. There will be records of this talks, so if you are interested in the talks, if you have missed, you will see them online. Okay, let's see this other one. Um, how to deal with access levels? Access levels. Well, there was a, a write-up 
there's, um, the, Apollo, the Apollo team is um, writing a lot of these uh, questions online. So you have the blog from the Apollo uh, client team, and this was covered this way. So you, you can go also to the GraphQL Explorer, and it's on the, um, it's on the tutorials. So you have exactly how to implement this there, an example. Hello. <laughs> well, it's good that you tried. OK, maybe we're done. Oh, no. How to deal with different authorization levels in REST. We can use own logic and allow some users. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is pretty much the, the other question. I mean, the way you deal with it is there are different ways, um, so it's not, it's not an easy uh, answer. It's, it's more, it depends on your infrastructure and who is holding the information of this authorization. Maybe it's a different server, maybe you can deal with it in the GraphQL server implementation. Um, it very much depends on how it's your setup. But it's totally, totally, uh, totally doable. Okay, I think we take another one. Yeah, that's, that's probably the last one. Okay, well, let's let's just cover this one and we finish. How to implement a pagination in uh, in the list endpoint? So the way the way I can implement that with GraphQL which is not my own implementation of the GraphQL server, is by using this uh, first and skip. So I can just easily implement this uh, pagination by using this tool. So you use it like an offset, and then you just implement a pagination like you would do in SQL. Um, so, well, that was all. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk.